following eight months is dry, but we do have a lovely high water table and hope that it stays that way. Goa could really be the land of plenty. It has everything it needs to, to grow food abundantly. Where there are a few challenges to actually uh, doing it. So we'll look now at some of the concrete or less concrete stepping stones um, to what we did on our own home garden and food forest. We wanted to grow our own food for quite a long time, but faced the usual issue, which is uh, a lack of land to actually grow on. Okay. And I think uh, that's something that a lot of people face. So for quite a long time, we just muddled down, trying to eat as healthily, healthily as possible, trying to source our food from the most desirable sources possible. But uh, we started learning more and more about um, the ridiculous extent to which pesticides are used in the food that's available to us every day. You know, wherever we went, it's, this basically is the state of uh, agriculture today. We were looking for reasonable convenience, but just couldn't find land that was conventionally suitable within a reasonable, reasonable <coughs> distance. The only thing we could actually find in the vicinity of a house that was available for, uh, to purchase was this uh, bun that you can see on the left. And actually, this is after major improvement. What it was was a little ridge on the edge of the field. Um, all the stones that you can see here had actually been stolen by the neighbors in the years ahead, prior. Apart from the fact that a bund is normally composed of all the rocks, etc., from, from the land around you, it had also been used as a dumping site for construction debris for the last uh, couple of decades. So that's what we started with. And uh, we began working on it slowly. The retaining wall started looking at fencing. And what you can see there is that we opted for living fencing instead of uh, hardware, there's a row of uh, glyricidia stakes to be seen on the extreme edge of each picture, as well as looking ahead, um, the stakes that you can see in the ground, again, glyricidia that was with multiple uses in mind. It was meant to serve as trellises for growing pumpkins and gourds as uh, shade and support for fruit trees that would come a little later. We are surrounded by fields which actually lie fallow most of the time, because of which we took our time actually starting to, to put things in the ground. There's a few chilies and aubergines there that are kind of scraggly and not doing very well. But we weren't too concerned because we needed to get the fencing up first because, well, we were surrounded by cattle and goats and dogs and, and our own dog. It started taking shape slowly. What you can see that the trellis is taking form on which we started growing stuff. One of our favorite pioneer species is sweet potato along with uh, radish, lemongrass, vetiver. And as you can see, it slowly began establishing itself, changing the uh, quality of the, of the soil. In a few sections, we decided to pamper the uh, pamper future crops a little, and uh, actually went to a headache of uh, digging out the soil for about a foot and a half, sifting it, getting all the pebbles out. Slowly began planting. And there you see Rosie in the early days serving a little patch of greens. And it slowly starts getting better and better as all the work on soil improvement started uh, showing results and a little better. We started being able to get, get our hands on mulch, no mulch, another dog. And that's Rosie starting to look happy and happier with what's coming out of the garden, slowly maturing. We went for a lot of diversity right from the word go. So even in this little patch that you can see, there's probably about uh, 19 or 20 different things growing. One of our first banana circles, we used that space in, in between as a first one of our first compost pits. That's another compost pit that we used. The stakes are made, uh, again, use glyricidia. We prefer to compost on the ground rather than in pits. Okay, this, this allows for aeration. Another benefit for people who have concerns about rats, etc. Glyricidia is called Madre de Cacao in South America, where cocoa is grown. And that's because when you strip off the leaves, crumple them a bit, then sprinkle them on the area, it repels rats, repels rodents. It was a fairly small piece of land, so we were looking to grow as much as possible and maximize output. Not for commercial reasons, it's never been a commercial proposition, but uh, just for our own. So we went vertical. These little pipes are absolutely brilliant in 
one square feet of space, you could get 40 heads of bok choy, which is great for people who actually don't have soil. If you live in an apartment and just have a patio or balcony, this works. That's leaf mustard, the spinach growing in there, arugula. We did the same with the goats and pumpkins. Wherever we found trees wanting fruit or flower, we'd send uh, pumpkins up them. These are ash goats. In this case, uh, you can't really tell from this pic, but uh, these are actually about 25 feet uh, off the ground. Harvesting wasn't easy. <laughs> we also went sideways. And these systems also, they're great for balconies or terraces. One of these could comfortably meet the average family's salad needs non-stop if you just use succession planting. Sweet potatoes. It's not that we didn't have a share of problems. We did have a few creepy crawlies. Some are small, some a little bigger, some much bigger. So this was an animal controlled division except that they started following us around all over the place, which got to be a problem. But nevertheless, before too long, it started producing extremely well. And uh, there's loads of diversity here. You'd end up with an array of like this at noon and then have to figure out how to put it all together for a meal by one o'clock. <laughs> and it's not just that day, all the time. Every single thing you can see that's edible, including that hibiscus, which is a medicinal species that you actually eat raw, use, a, use in a tea. These are huckleberries, Solanum necrum. To get to the point where our output was like this, I think this is barely about a year and a half after we started. Okay, so to anybody who's dithering about whether to begin kitchen gardening or not, Please, it's not that difficult. Okay. You saw that strip of land at the start, completely bare and barren. A couple of years ago, this is pretty much what it looked like all the time. Okay. Uh, ideal is to have absolutely no bare soil to be seen whatsoever. This would be at its most challenge at the height of summer. This is pretty much what, it, uh, we don't have many recent photographs simply because there's so much growing there. It's difficult for us to get clear angles that will actually show more than, you know, five or six feet of the garden at a time. Just to put that in, um, to put that in perspective too, the, the width of that piece of property is five meters. So you, there's, not my, there's nowhere to go. You've got plants all around you and food growing all around you. We don't use too many straight lines. So, so there's no long avenues down which to take pics. We'll show you a list of what we grow. There's a few more as well. <laughs> Perhaps just a few more. <laughs> okay, one more slide. <laughs> Listen, sorry. Okay, that actually is it. I'm going to turn you over to Rosie now. What she'll go on to is simply, like I said, it's not difficult at all, uh, not rocket science. Of course, I actually hate saying that because that uh, downplays the care and attention, the amount of input, the amount of knowledge that uh, farmers must possess to farm successfully. And I think, think it sucks really badly that we will accord a huge amount of respect to the average doctor, lawyer, engineer, etc. Although we use them maybe once a year, once in two years, but we use a farmer three times a day, every single day. Working with a number of places apart from our own, we've kind of 
come up with a checklist of a few things that you must pay attention to straight off if you want to be reasonably certain of maximizing your success from the word go. And these are pretty much the key points that we look at. Water, because very often the success of a failure of your, of your growing will depend very much on how much attention you've paid to understanding how much water you actually have access to and how you'll be able to deploy it and what your water needs are going to be. The total is about 600 odd meters square. The food forest area is 350 meters square and five meters wide, so of one very long patch. And the home kitchen garden is 250 meters square and a little wider. It goes up to seven meters wide in some, some parts. So an acre is 4,000 meters square, and our growing area is about 607 max, mm, to give you a perspective. It's a fairly self-evident, so by and large, as you probably heard at a couple of other presentations today, work on your soil, just pay attention to your soil before you do anything else. Once you start putting stuff, uh, plants in the ground, they, they look after themselves. Pay attention to sunlight. Put some thought into the selection of the plants that you grow. So the first point we bring up is design. The more thought you put into what you're going to do, the less actual work you will need to do. You want to design for nature to be care taking care of the needs of your garden and your own needs. I highly recommend you find out as much as you can. There are lots of resources. Learn as much as you can. Anything you learn you'll carry with you pretty much forever and tr transmit to others. And you'll be hearing a lot about design in itself over the convergence, so we won't spend a lot of time on, on the actual design process. This is an idea of when we first put down the design, it's very simple, it's a piece of paper and a pen. It doesn't have to be complicated. Think through what your needs are, think through what the capabilities of the land are, and, and find a match there. This is the, the proportions of the kitchen garden area and the proportions of the food forest area, which extends on from there. The next point you want to consider is water. It's surprisingly often uh, people... You, you hear often in Goa people say there's no water problem in Goa. There's a massive water problem in Goa. There's 3,000 millimetres of rain a year most of it uh, runs off the land, is not soaked in. Goa is facing massive development, concretization, and even to the point of actually cutting trenches through paddy fields to drain off the excess water, which is madness. Look at, if, when you're designing your own properties, how much actual rain you do have and how much rain you might not have. When you're building something like a food forest, people say, oh, you don't need to water it, you don't need to, to pay much attention to it. This is true when the, when the forest starts maturing. So you want to consider, if you're putting in a lot of effort to putting small young uh, saplings or even seeds in, make sure you have what you need to water it during its establishment period. It's a really simple point, but it's the entire success of your, uh, your growth. D design simply, if you, if you have a well, Maybe you can put your highest uh, water needs around the well, put your driest things further away, think about the way you use the property. Something that's far for one person might not be far for you. It's about the way you move uh, within a property and what suits your needs. Water harvesting is really important. If we want to keep that water table high, we have to put all of the water that we receive back into the ground. And the best place to store water is the soil. A principle to think about is slowing the water down, spreading it out and letting it sink in and sinking into the earth. Put plants in the ground. Living roots will work your soil and allow the rain to, to permeate into your soil and they'll actually hold the moisture there where it's needed for your plants as well. Add more organic matter to your soil. When you've got a soil that's high in organic matter, you can expect it to hold water as much as 10 times or more than a soil that doesn't have organic matter. Don't let a drop leave your property. Um, the first drawing we showed was um, a space which has our house on it, which has a hard roof. Around that house is about two metres all around. So the, the, the hard uh, occupation of space is very high as a ratio. We still manage from, from that 
section of the property to keep every single drop on the land. We don't drain anything off. Even though it's around our home, even in areas where people say, oh, you can't have water here, it has to go. If you've got plenty of organic matter in your soil, the ground can hold it. And we rarely see a puddle now. There's just, there's no puddling and there's no um, stagnation of water. It has somewhere to go and is being so soaked up by that organic matter. Um, and you're aiming to, to really to raise the water table. Um, we have a, a tiny spot and we put all the water back. Across the paddy field, somebody's dug a big well and they sell the water off in trucks. So there's a certain irony there, but we all still have to, to do that and, and work towards um, everybody doing it. If we saved all the water we had, there would be no water worries at all. Um, and Goa is facing a, a, a depleting water table, even though it's uh, comparatively very high. One of the, the tools you can use for uh, water, for soil building, is some earthworks, which basically means uh, taking your soil, manipulating a, l a little bit in order to serve your needs. And a, a great example is what do you do with water when, you've, when you feel you've got too much water, even though you can never really have too much water. Um, you might want to s sculpt the land a little. It might be something called a swale. It might be a simple uh, bund. It might be a trench. It might be a hole. We work with things called banana circles, which in Goa are, are extraordinary tools to use. Um, you can work with ponds and seasonal water bodies. For any of the changes that you make, you will have dramatic effects. You can look at one area of your land and make one change to it, kind of sculpting it in a way, making water go where you want it to go, and that will have dramatic effects to, to the moisture holding soak of your land. This is a simple example of um, we've grown a row of bananas in a trench and bun system, and we're now extending that system as time permits. We simply dig out the soil in a line or a curve. It can be any, a banana circle can be star shaped if you like, it can be anything you really want it to be. It's the principle that counts. So here it's very little effort to, to dig up some soil. This gives you an idea of what the interior looks like. This is a, a distance shot dug up soil. This is a more uh, traditional circle as such when it's first been installed. So what you're seeing there is, if you can see, it's a circle shape. The center has been dug out a couple of feet. The soil has been placed on the sides to create a bund. The baby bananas are planted on that bund. And the center is filled with organic matter. Now that can be anything you can get your hands on. It can be tree branches, it can be leaves, it can be, um, you can compost in it if you want to. There's a lot of scope for doing different things. And we've got a thick, heavy wood mulch on the top, simply because our chickens Chickens are free range and they come in and they scratch everything up, which we don't want. So in that area where the, the little plants are planted, those pieces of wood are a bit heavy for the chickens. They don't want, they've got other fun to have. They don't want to um, spend their time there. And this is a mature circle. Um, actually around the, the trench you saw going in in the first images, this is a mature part of the system and it's growing a little tree which is great for nesting birds. They love that tree. There's pandanus leaf, there are papayas, there are bananas, um, lemongrass, a bit of vetiver in there, some uh, citronella. And that system has been created really from just a line or two of, of dugout soil. It's incredibly simple. The other benefit of that banana style type planting, banana circle principle, is that once it's full of organic matter, it will hold a huge amount of water. So your watering needs go down. It's also a, a self-fertilizing system whereby the organic matter is breaking down, feeding microorganisms, fungi, etc. And it's a whole little ecosystem into, unto itself. For irrigation, we irrigate. We have a high water table and we, we use it. We're very conscious of the, the water that we do use. There are parts of the garden that we hardly have to touch at all and others with the more intensive, say, salad greens, which you have to water um, fairly frequently. We're using a, a, an open well that we had to dug. We pump to a raised tank and gravity feed. Um, we use hand watering. Um, we find, you know, a lot of people say, oh, put in an irrigation system or um, drip. And that's an installation in itself. 
um, it's an installation that's uh, that's not foolproof. You still have to keep an eye on it. You still have to maintain it when there are problems. So we find that on a, on a garden of this size, it's it makes perfect sense to go around and water the plants. It doesn't take that much time. It enables us to assess the plants as we see them, give a little more, give a little less. And also with, with some techniques that we'll talk about shortly, we water our garden uh, in winter time, so December, Jan, um, once every four to five days, instead of once or twice a day, as many people are doing in the hot sun during the day. Fencing, Peter mentioned the importance of fencing. It's so often overlooked. People are so excited to start planting. They say, oh, it's okay, the cows won't come, the goats won't come, the people won't come, uh, the dogs, wild dogs won't come and trample, the goats won't jump over the fence. If you're, if you're growing on a, a basically a piece of rock like it was, no, they won't come. There's nothing for them to come for. They've got way more interesting things to eat elsewhere. When you're growing on a piece of rock situated as we are, among, uh, in the center of a whole bunch of fields lying fallow, within a few months we were like an oasis of green and we turned into a cow magnet. <laughs> yeah. So think about what is it that you're keeping out and also what is it that you're keeping in. Every environment will have different elements, whether it be human or animal. You can consider uh, the lifespan of fencing hardware. There's a bit of an illusion that if you come in and you, and you build expensive fences that they will last forever and require no maintenance, maintenance. It's invariably not the case. So the choice that we make um, when we're doing fencing is because the fencing in our environment needs to be immediate, um, we look to a, a, a much cheaper, less intensive hardware and we um, supplement it with living fences. Living fences can be super solid on day one if you have appropriate materials available. Norm normally these days we don't. So we'll use a, a, a amalgamation, a, a hybrid mix, if you like, of, of light hardware fencing and living fencing that over the time that the light hardware is deteriorating and wearing, the living fence will have grown in and taken its place and then actually be providing you with additional material to maintain or, or extend your system. So with the, the same idea of the living uh, fence, it extends to trellising, borders, any kind of marking that you want to give to your land, staking, all of these materials. Um, we were very lucky to have a, a grove of Gliricidia right near us, which nobody cared about, and we were able to, to basically just go and harvest cuttings from there. So we started with those. Now we have all of our functional structures, if you like, all growing and producing, and we just cut those down when we need them and use them. Anything we don't, anything in excess is also used for, for other things that we'll talk about. They're totally regenerative, they're renewable, they're biodegradable, no, nothing to go and get once it's on your property, nothing to discard of once your system changes a little bit. And, and they're fulfilling multiple functions, which is really important. They're serving as a potential windbreak, um, a living fence, depending on the species, can provide you with food, can provide um, birds and animals with food. Uh, can be a visual screen, can give you biomass, firewood, many, many things just from a fence. So at one point people say, oh, living fences, you have to maintain them, you have to do something. I see it very differently. When we maintain our fence, we're actually harvesting. We're actually taking additional materials. We're, we're doing multiple functions at the same time. And that's the species that we absolutely love to use uh, is Gliricidia sepia, and it's very common and very, very effective. This is an example of a living fence going onto the padding, paddy field, which has not been installed at, at the time of that photograph very long ago. You can see they're very fine pieces, very accessible, mm, like a month or so old. Um, this one is not a particularly strong fence, but that wasn't its focus. Its focus is to consolidate the, the very fine hardware you see behind that. Um, so it's already growing, it's already adding biodiversity, all kinds of things we'll talk about. These are some examples of living trellises. So on these we can grow beans, we can grow cucumbers, anything that, that climbs. They were also an important part of regenerating the land. This is the same living trellis, but when you start you have your uprights that are living and you sort of 
string some other pieces of glaricidia across. Um, what we've done there, this one has just been pruned right down so you don't see the growth, but now all the laterals are living too. And with this plant, once the laterals go in, it starts shooting off even more shoots. So one, you might think, oh, that's a lot of work for a trellis. It's really simple. You go to the trellis, you want to harvest, for example, cucumber. You're harvesting cucumber and you're chopping and dropping the excess foliage off the trellis. It's a, it's a one, one action, if you like. It's not an additional thing that you need to do. This is an example of a border. In the kitchen garden, we use borders. Our dogs are trained to stay off the beds uh, and not go into the beds. So they identify with this border as a very specific limit. Um, and also when we have people in the garden, uh, we have no till beds. So it's extremely important that the, the beds aren't walked on. So again, it's a nice visual indicator that, that keeps lets people know not to go there. And this is just a, an idea of what it looks like when it first goes in. It's that simple, lots of cuttings into the ground. You can see running the long of the path there, the length of the path. That's another little uh, glaricidia border, about a foot high. And it's in full foliage and creating all kinds of edge, a place for beneficial insects to be, shade. Uh, glaricidia is nitrogen fixing, so when you, you cut it back, you're getting more biomass, you're fixing, releasing that nitrogen. And examples of um, pretty much permanent staking in the garden that we have, instead of growing plants and trying to stake them, we have this sort of permanent stake system. So the example there is with crops that don't necessarily need them straight away, but they stay there, they keep growing, um, and they're available any time we need them. So we don't have to do that extra job of going out staking. Another imp important part is that just when it's getting really hot, April and May, Gliracidia goes wild. It absolutely loves itself. It's bright green, it's lush. So when the garden needs that extra shade, you let all of the Gliracidia um, come into full branch and foliage, which is protecting the land. It's providing more moisture um, and a lot, lot more shade than uh, what would normally be there. I'd say the key point, often people say, you know, what can I do for my soil? What can I do for my garden? If you're going to do anything, it's mulch. It protects the, the soil from heavy sun. Heavy sun will, will parch the soil. It will um, kill off any kind of soil life in the, in the first part of the first layers of the soil and the sun penetrates really quickly. It protects the soil from lashing rains. You get a lot of compaction from, from heavy rains and you get potential erosion uh, as well. When you mulch, you end up holding an, an extraordinary amount of water in the soil from day one. You, you put your mulch down, don't be shy. We, if you can get the material, you get as much as you can. If you go for a six inch mulch on your land, from day one, you will go from watering every day to watering minimum every, every three days, let's say, in the, in the early years. It, it breaks down, it provides food to the microorganisms, um, simple case of earthworms. They come up, they've got something to eat, they leave their castings there. They travel back into the soil, they make channels, it allows your water to filter. It kicks off so many systems that are working for you just by placing mulch on the ground. You can never have too much. You don't say, oh, you know, I'll just, you, you often see people put a little bit of uh, paddy straw down or a few leaves and that's mulching. You've, you've got to let it build up um, to a good thickness. Keep it, you know, away from the, the stalks of your plants. You don't want to smother your plants, but it, it can be covering the entire uh, ground. If you can get it, various different kinds of plant mat mat matter as mulches give various nutrients, various benefits. Mulch suppresses weeds. Um, our weeding activities are one of the things we do when we harvest. The main jobs of the garden are either watering or harvesting. So when we go out to harvest, we'll cut down the extra gliricida we, we talked about. We'll see perhaps a plant that we may or may not want coming up through the mulch, we'll just pull it out and stick it under the mulch. We don't even have to take it anywhere. It, it gives a lot of ease to, to maintaining the garden. Imitate a healthy forest floor. You don't want to see bare soil. It's hard to, to get to, but you, by focusing on, on keeping the soil covered, you will eventually get there, whether you're growing the biomass or you're begging or borrowing or acquiring elsewhere.
And for us, the, on, the only drawback to mulch that we've seen is that because we like systems that take care of themselves and provide a lot of abundance, the idea of self-seeders is very attractive. When you've got mulch um, that's effectively blocking out weeds, you're also mostly affecting uh, your self-seeders. So that's one of the drawbacks we've come across. But it, it's not enough to um, take away from all the advantages. It's also really hard to get. You have to make a fairly conscious effort to get mulch, especially in the early days. For us, I'd say we're about 90% uh, independent in mulch now with all of the, the systems that we've got going. In Goa, it, um, I know in temperate climates, mulch and slugs are an issue. In Goa, we don't have any slugs um, at all that come to the garden. We have a different kind of slug in the paddy fields right next door, but we've not had one inch, uh, instance of slugs. And we haven't seen any instance of non-beneficial insect life in the mulch. If you're putting in seedlings directly into the ground, you're not going to put mulch on top of them. One, one thing we do as a small space is we, we rarely put um, seeds directly into the ground. We, we grow out seedlings and we transplant. And what we do to do that is the ground is already mulched. We simply open up a hole, use a little hand trowel, dig it out, pop the seedling in, and leave a little space around, whether it be a tiny seedling or a sapling for a tree, you leave that, that space there. You don't want to smother your, your plants with mulch. Yeah, you want plenty of it, but a nice little clearing so they can breathe. And you know, a question that we're looking at now is that we've put so much organic matter into the soil. Is there a point where we can now start pulling back? It's been three years of intensive adding organic matter, getting roots in the soil, doing all the things we do. As it is difficult to find mulch in the kind of qu quantities we're looking at, what other plants can we be using that are a kind of permanent living mulch that we're working around that will make our lives much easier? So that's the big question now is how to um, do that effectively. This is uh, simply a photograph showing you that there's lots of mulch, if you can see it through the plants. It's excess just stored in a very simple pile. Some of it will start to break down. <coughs> the rapidity that we'll use it just a little bit will on the surface um, between the soil and the dry mulch. This is an example of uh, in the food forest area because your mulches will be different according to your needs, according to what you can get and according to what kind of plants you're growing. So this is a result of chop and drop. Um, there are tree prunings, there's bits of paddy straw, there are deciduous tree leaves their foliage that's died back there's you can see a bit of sweet potato there which we keep as a we never we don't uh, we used it as a pioneer in the beginning and it just keeps coming back some of those potatoes will actually form tubers we don't harvest them they're they're there to open up the soil eventually rot feed microorganisms etc this is just another kind of mulch that we use um, for our deep litter chicken systems is quite large uh, trimmings from a sawmill and it's a sawmill that treats large trees so it's not uh, not the treated material yet for permaculturists compost may not be um, that critical an issue so for food forest perhaps you might not bother but for a kitchen garden I think uh, all of us would want to see results fairly quickly and to make sure that we're getting as much output as we can with a minimum of work. If you compost, that's little like supercharging that whole soil improvement process that you'd otherwise take a lot more time about. As Clea there will attest to, one of the keys to having great output from a kitchen garden is to do whatever you can to have uh, beneficial, diverse and profuse microbial life. What we would recommend is implementing multiple methods of composting. Don't stick to just one. We use if about six different methods. Hmm. Most of them are fairly simple and uh, uh, low input. You already know about compost piles, your leave-in pots, the cumbers, etc. If you have livestock, poultry, goats, a cow, a lot of people have these fairly close to the house and kind of partly regret it because of the odor. If you use a deep litter system, in other words, you have up to about a foot, of, a foot or more of organic matter, leaves, twigs, hay, the works. Number one, there'll be no, virtually no odor at all. We've got 50 heads of poultry surrounding the house. Normally that place would be a stinking mess, ex especially when it starts raining. 
but we always have about uh, a pile that deep of minimum of wood shavings, leaves, uh, you name it, whatever organic matter we can get get our hands on, and you'd, you'd never know there's actually poultry that close by. Okay. Now, the odor side, what also happens is uh, if you understand composting and the importance of having enough nitrogen to go with your carbon to kick the process off, remember that your animals are constantly letting loose a stream of high nitrogen that keeps getting mixed in. You don't even have to do the mixing, they will do it themselves. If it's cattle, they will trample it in. If it's chickens, they will scratch about. As far as the chickens are concerned, they will, um, because of the amount of uh, insect life that this pile will now hold, it uh, substantially improves the diet, giving you much healthier eggs. The other thing we would recommend is that you look at always composting above ground, not in pits. It's very hard to keep it from going anaerobic if they're in pits. Uh, sorry, if your compost is in pits, and then you end up with something that looks like it's uh, rich but doesn't really do very much for you. Often when people compost in pits, they build a concrete pit with a hard base, and that basically makes the job almost really difficult. On that front, when we create a banana circle, we will uh, dig a pit there and fill it up with carbon, twigs and leaves. Now, when you're composting, you will put your household waste on top of that and in the usual fashion, layer it with leaves every time you add it. So, over time, in most of a banana circles, there's actually a pile about this high that's created over time. The, the issue is simply that you have the risk of compaction and waterlogging when it rains, and that's when you have a problem. If you're able to make sure that there's, uh, your mixture is light enough, because you, you keep adding carbon uh, to keep it from compacting, you're probably okay. But I notice that a lot of people when they decide they've got to compost to feed the garden, they create concrete cement pits in the ground. And that excludes there. One of our favorite ways of uh, getting high quality compost that will give you a lot of uh, microbial life is hot composting. You can look this up and find in more information on it easily enough. The key things I would uh, stick to saying about this here are just pay careful attention to how you build your carbon and nitrogen ratios. And those figures below are temperatures. If it doesn't reach 55 degrees, you're not really composting yet. If it crosses 75, you're killing off all the microbes that uh, you want to end up with. You need to monitor this carefully, get the appropriate kind of thermometer, turn when you need to. But like it says, don't turn more than necessary. Uh, again, if you've got time, we'll cover that a little later. One that's used for, uh, in the food industry steel mm. because you want a long probe otherwise you stick your hand in which is actually fine uh, because within about uh, five days or so building a pile properly you stick your hand in take it out to you you won't find it uh, offensive at all now, uh, once you uh, when you get used to it you uh, develop a feel for when it's too hot or not hot enough just a note on the methods too uh, we use about six different methods which go from the absolutely uh, simplest, pile it up, leave it for a year, come back. But um, the more, um, the higher input, higher knowledge methods where you monitor a little more will, will give you fairly extraordinary results. If you don't feel up to doing that, you don't have to. You can, you can keep composting extremely simple. And there are multiple methods. And the key is, like when you would do anything, you, you have a number of choices and you look at what works for you. So. The various methods you hear about are all valid. Mo most of them are valid. Choose what works for you and what you're up to doing. I'm really lazy. I pile it up and I walk away and I come back a year later and that's done. <laughs> but I'm glad I've got this guy to do the more um, involved stuff as well. Bomb composting is another of my favorites. Strictly speaking, for this, you should actually be talking to the father of Indian bomb composting, who's uh, <laughs> right there. Fine, mother works for me. <laughs> If you're warmly composting, please make it a point to just skim the castings off regularly and use them straight away. Hmm? A key facet of uh, wormy composting, just like hot composting, is the microbial life in the worm castings. They will last a finite amount of time. Don't use it, you lose it. We, we're pole opposites when it comes to schools of composting. I don't want to do anything, and Peter is really good at getting into the nitty-gritty and, and putting together something that's 
quite special and quite technical. But this is one of my favorite methods, which is can be in situ. Your, your mulch is eventually becoming humus. It's eventually decomposing. So that's one of the other benefits of mulching, is that little process is happening for you. Um, we, we pile up all of our extra organic material all around the edges and over time with termites and, and fungi and, and um, the microorganisms that are touching the soil, it, it breaks down. Worm activity too. When you've got a lot of organic material on your soil, you walk out there in the monsoon and all we see is castings, is just towers and towers of castings everywhere. So for me, the value of seeing that happening naturally is fantastic. That said, if you're in a more restricted urban environment, you're doing something very special, there's a very strong value in a designed vermicomposting uh, process. It's worth looking at urine as a fertility enhancer. Look it up, try it out. <laughs> if you're concerned about odour, if you've got lots of uh, carbonaceous material, there won't be any at all. Uh, it kind of depends on the strength of the plants that you're watering. If they are strong, robust plants, you won't have an issue. If they are seedlings, you, pen you pen potentially might. For activation, you could use slurry. Green leaves. Anything that's a source of nitrogen. So it could be cow dung, it could be chicken, chicken poop, green leaves. I think he's looking for an activate... Um, yeah, there's just a picture of some earth with worm activity. You can see a few castings around. He's coming up to find any decomposed or organic matter. This is worm castings in situ. Um, nothing has been added other than mulch. It's all happening without us. We don't need to do anything. This is an example of my favorite, uh, well, not quite favorite, cause, because this one has a structure around it. My favorite is just a pile, and it, it does its thing. We use one like this for any kitchen scraps we have. We had hardly any kitchen scraps, because we have dogs and poultry. Um, but anything we do have, we put into these cages, which are a bit more structured. So for things like rats, people often con are concerned about rats. Rats and dogs and cats will come in and mess about in your pile and make a mess. So this just reduces a little bit. But when I come out and I see that a, a rat has been rummaging around in the compost, I'm thrilled. They're, they're leaving their manure there, they're aerating, they're, they're peeing on it. They're, there's a whole world happening there. And often they'll kick it out the sides of this and I just have to come and scoop it up. And that to me is, is magic. Fungi, this is a, a massive uh, topic, but we'll just touch on it very lightly. If you're using a lot of organic matter, you're going to get um, fungi in all its forms, mycelium, etc. This is mostly a really good thing. So when you start to see all of this mushroom life in your land, you can generally be pretty happy about it. It's, you, you can also turn it to your advantage, um, start growing uh, edible species. We haven't done that yet. We're at the process of just trying to identify uh, you know, these things that we're seeing. But it would be great to, to leverage that uh, capacity at some point as well. So human urine is fantastic. It's portable. We can take it everywhere. We can take whatever we ate out home back into our systems. It can be extremely simple. Our house received a toilet before we got there, so now we use in our you know, normal bathroom, we just use a two-bucket system, which is filled with uh, biomass on one side. On the other side, you do your business, and you pop some biomass on, on top of it. And this is in a, in a closed environment. There is zero odor at all. You wouldn't know it's there. Um, our dogs don't know it's there either. That would be a lovely surprise. Um, we, <laughs> we actually have a history of, of showing that human ewer was great and there was no smell and nobody knew what was going on when we lived in an apartment. There's just nobody knew. It was our little secret. Um, so to not exploit human ewer and urine, I think, is a massive waste of resources for the material it gives you, but also the idea of using fresh water to, to pee and poop in is, is absurd. These systems, even though we say, yeah, they're pretty simple, um, it's like anything, they have to be used well. They can be used well in simplicity. 
but do your research, work it out, because human sewage basically can, if it's used poorly, cause a lot of problems. So don't, don't oversimplify it, even though when it's well thought out, it can be very, sim it's very simple. Um, there's a great book which is available as a, as a book, published book, um, and the author has also made it a free um, or authorised download on the internet. So if you want to get a, a taste of that. I don't. No. I, I use everything at once. It still works. It costs me more organic matter because the urine is more liquid. If you're not soaking it up, then you're going to get smells, then you're going to get the anaerobic state, then it's going to all, all go bad. So by not separating that, it's costing me more organic matter. So it's an equation. Leaves, so sawdust, large wood, wood chips. Um, you can even use soil at the end of the day. It's like starting off compost systems as well. There's nothing more simple than having some fish heads or some fairly, actually, anything that we don't want dogs or rats to actually get to. If we have bones that aren't going to the dog for some reason because they're particularly large, we bury them. We bury them and we stick a rock on top. And in quantities like that, it's not going to hurt you so little. It's only going to be a, a, a good input. I take it to a, a long-term pile towards the end of the food forest, and it sits there for... Well, it hasn't been emptied yet, so... No, 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 I empty the bucket. No, they go into a compost pile. Yeah, but a, a very specific one. It's not mixed with the other composts. And you'll see as well, it's actually quite hard to fill up. You, you might we are committed but not crazy. <laughs> um, organic matter breaks down really fast. If you can fill up your composting system of your own, you know, there's just pretty much just the two of us. We're not a large family. It's impossible to fill up. We haven't, it's never been emptied. It just stays there and, and, and one day will be used. Um, there's no leaching of any sort. As I'm a lazy composter, I think I would leave it as long as I can. I'd say I, I've used these uh, systems in temperate climate and one year works. Here it should be quicker. But as I don't have a need to it, I haven't really pushed the exploration of it. So that's something that could be done. But it's important to manage it well. You don't want to use it too fresh on your leafy greens, for example. That would be inviting trouble. Yeah. The connection with poultry. We have chickens, muscovy ducks, uh, guinea fowl and geese. They're free range, but not in the kitchen garden. You have to make a very fine line between your poultry and your garden, whether it's some kind of travelling tractor or whatever you like. We just choose to keep ours out because that works for us. I just got to say this. I see a lot of references and suggestions that you deal with pest problems in your vegetable patch by turning chickens loose. You're going to have chickens, they're going to have veggies. <laughs> and really good eggs once they've eaten everything. Yeah, so about free range. Keep them out of the kitchen garden or devise a system. If you're working with small places and, and you want to do chicken tractors, things like this, fantastic. But, but do the research and work it out. Don't let your chickens go wild on your, on your veggies. That's great for a mature food forest to have ducks, chickens um, roaming around there. They, they can't do any damage. They're actually only doing um, positive things. We get eggs and we get meat from our poultry. We get fertility via their manure in the deep litter composting. Waste management, if our peelings... Often, often when we're preparing food, I'm extra generous with my cuttings. I, I won't think, oh, I better get every inch out of this vegetable because I'm giving um, the poultry a treat. You know, they like bananas too. They like all these things that we like. So there's absolutely no notion of, of waste with them. Yeah, they're constantly working for you. Um, they can be a pest control. Uh, we have poultry all around our house. We have high um, organic matter all around our house. And we don't want termites upstairs. So these guys do a lot of work. I mean, the termites have lots to eat anyway. They have organic matter everywhere. But these guys will eat rhino beetles, which attack coconut trees. They will eat um, all, all kinds of things. M mice, you don't get mice around. We rarely get snakes, despite the, the photographs in those areas. Here's just some pictures of our birds roaming around. They're the geese. The geese are a wonderful doorbell. 
Um, we can be at the bottom of the food forest, which is all that length away. If anybody comes that they don't know, they'll make a, a real racket, and we know what's going on at any point. Um, they lay beautiful eggs as well. This is the, the house. with You can see the deep litter through there. You can also see Gliracidia and other hedgings there. The chickens are totally free range. We're lucky in our situation where they're not bothering neighbours and things like that because that's also a consideration. And we're lucky in the fact that the neighbours' dogs have now been trained not to go for the chickens. And we don't have too many dangers. But they're, they're things to think about if you're looking at uh, free range birds. And this is the result. You just saw the, the mulch in the front yard. This is what we get at the end of end season, yeah. And so we just take that and we use it wherever we need it. It's a great stock. This is a little system we've just put together um, using the ducks, the duck water. We just had to pull down our entire front yard because for neighbour issues, as we're in a sort of semi-urban, suburban environment, we had to, to build a solid wall. Um, so we had to pull everything down and um, are starting to rebuild the system and have a, a sort of banana circle type thing happening with four or five species in it and they're benefiting from this water and this water is enough to feed a few of those systems so as time allows we'll extend that system. There's the ducks playing and pooping and helping us. We'll race through with some points. I think the species is really important. I'd love to talk to you about Gliracidia, find out about it. It's so valuable as a, a pioneer. Gliracidia flower, which is beautiful as well. Sticks ready for propagating. Perennials. Perennials are everything. If you put these plants in the ground, they'll feed you almost endlessly with very little work. They grow, perennials are plants that grow for many seasons as opposed to annually planting out. And there are so, so many different kinds you can look to. You can have short-lived perennials, which will give you a few years' service, and others that will give you many, many years' service. Let's have a look at some of them. Some of the ones that feed us and folks we know uh, very, very consistently. This is talinum, which is a leafy green, raw or cooked. These are the blossoms of the bazella, which we use um, in multiple ways, raw and cooked. Kangkong, raw or cooked. These are, are flowers off the Camecostas diabetes plant. We use the fresh shoots as a, as a lime, soury highlight and, and the sweet flowers. And they grow by, by cuttings and they just, just keep coming. These are drumstick leaves, lab lab hyacinth bean, wing bean, butterfly pea flowers, green papaya, very important food for us in, in, in all its permutations, green bananas, raw bananas, Brinjal, we've had plants in service that have given, yeah, th three years, given us uh, harvest twice a week for three years solid. And they recently became less productive. They were cut down with the roots in the ground, and two of them have re-spurted back up, and they're already in flower and going to fruit. And we've had to do virtually nothing to have that yield. Uh, Koiti bean, wonderful bean, under underused bean. This is a xanthosoma. It's about this high. This variety, you cut it low on the ground, you have a huge stem, a huge leaf, chop it up, saute it, done. It sits there. You don't have to do really anything. It needs water. It needs fertility, but you, you're, your system's doing that for you anyway. Just in front of that was a, a new plant we're working with called Chaya. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. Synodoploplus something or other. Yeah, and... Uh, tree spinach. So that's another one we're looking toward forward to. We'll see if it makes it through the monsoon. This is uh, Peperomia, Vietnamese crab claw, wild, self-seeding, growing uh, medicinal and culinary herb. Torch ginger buds for flavor, um, vegetable, torch ginger flower, pepper in its dried and fresh form. This is Suran, elephant yam. Grow it from cuttings, grow it through the monsoon. It, it's really, these are the, really the no-brainer foods that feed us all the time. Questions? How many hours in a day each day you have to give to maintain such a... All about design. If you design carefully, you can run a small garden that will feed a family of four with about an hour a day. This garden takes our time, one of us, so combined time, one, one person one hour per day, 
And that's excluding watering. So depending on the time of the year, uh, we'll water once every four or five days or, or not at all during the monsoon. So that hour doesn't need to be daily. It might be after two weeks, we decide to spend all day on the weekend in the garden. Um, we might spend 10 minutes each day having a look through. Um, the biggest jobs are harvesting and any kind of succession seeding we're doing with annual crops. So I tend to shy away from those because I like to do other things as well. But we've worked out an hour a day and not consistently. It can be erratic, but it adds up to about that. Um, I think the varieties change a little bit. But um, you can, I mean, I've heard of people getting five years or more from Brinjal. As far as we can determine, the normal practice is for people to grow them during the lean season for cereal crops and then take them out because the productivity drops and they'd rather get another cash crop. Do you have any plans for page you have maintained about this uh, garden? Uh, yes. Something that's really important for us is sharing the knowledge that we gain. There's no point help helping it for us. There's so much to be learnt. There's so much information and knowledge that's been lost and needs to be reworked. If we're all working together, learning and sharing, there's not enough. I mean, it's, it's finite. It's never going to end. So we'd like to share and for people to share back with us. We have a Facebook page which is very specific to our own garden. And there's also a Permaculture Goer uh, fa Facebook group which is there to share experiences, share questions, um, create community. It's specific to Goa, but some healthy cross-pollination is... Yes, yeah, it's called quick stick as well. Seeds can be tricky, but cuttings work really well. It needs to actually keep animals out. Yes, the, the idea is that they do grow dense. For example, the fence is constantly growing and filling out. It's also being coppiced, which gives it an effect where it, it f fills out quite quickly as well. You can also, if you have the material available, you can actually build a fence which is solid immediately with large cuttings. The challenge is finding that amount of material. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. Thank you.